On the 15th of June 1920, a world-beating event took place in a dingy shed in, of all places, Chelmsford in Essex. From a makeshift studio in the Marconi radio factory in the town, the celebrated Australian opera singer Dame Nellie Melba, she who gave peach desserts and toast her signature name, performed Home Sweet Home, Nymphs and Shepherds, and Mimi's Adio from La Boheme by Puccini. It was a sensation. Heavily promoted by the Daily Mail, the concert was heard around Europe. It was broadcast radio's first major coup and a musical event like none before. And it did more than anything else to excite interest amongst the public in the new medium of wireless. Because it's easy to forget to what extent the first decades of the 20th century were a relatively silent time. Certainly people could talk to each other by telephone, and already in Paris from the 1890s onwards, the so-called Théâtrophone service, it was known as the Electrophone in London, allowed subscribers to eavesdrop on performances at the Comédie Française and the Opera. But if you didn't have access to a phonograph or a gramophone, or live in Paris or London or Budapest, the only music you heard was in your parlour, where families would still gather around the piano, or in the concert hall, or at the bandstand in the park. So actually to hear the sound of the operatic sensation of her age, Nellie Melba, performing for her unseen audience at that very selfsame moment, was, for listeners from London to Lisbon, a true and very real wonder. Melba arrived in a white Rolls Royce and swept into the dingy room in the Marconi factory, imperious as ever. Peter Eckersley would subsequently become chief engineer of the future BBC, but at that time he was working as a research scientist for Marconi. The place where she broadcast had a concrete floor, it was just a shed, and somebody thought, well, now this is a very important person. And they went to the local um, man and asked for a carpet for Dame Nellie Melba, and when she saw it, she said, roll that damn thing up, how can I sing on a carpet? Back in her native Australia, the event was front-page news. The London Daily Mail has been deluged with letters and telegrams testifying to the remarkable success of Dame Melba's wireless concert. Her singing was simultaneously heard in Paris, Berlin, The Hague, Madrid, Sweden and on all liners. British wireless amateurs are wildly enthusiastic. Cornwall reports, The Australian Nightingale was heard loud and clear. Gloucester telegraphs, it was simply beautiful. God bless her. And her secretary is in Paris. The BBC's historian, Jean Seaton. And there's a very good account of her secretary. It's taken into a studio and she hears it and she says, oh, it, it, it's, it's Dame Nelly singing. I hadn't really believed I would be able to hear it. I know it's her voice. And so that moment of recognising, not just a sound like on a scratchy rock, but an individual voice as it was being sung at that same time, because that's the other thing that's happening. It's one person to many, but it's instantaneous, and it's still the absolute, I think, acme of broadcasting live. Now the pressure was on to make broadcast wireless a reality in Britain. But it was a slow process. The post office, in whose gift the establishment of a national broadcaster lay, was cautious. They were worried that trivial wireless transmissions like the Melba concert would interfere with the vital voice traffic between aircraft and the ground. And they were also spooked by what was happening across the Atlantic. Because in America, radio station outshouted radio station with blaring music and advertisements with no regulation and no rigour. You couldn't hear the music for the music. Each station broadcast on top of the next, on the same wavelength, in a strange survival of the loudest trial of strength. For the British Post Office, that would never do. Meanwhile, low-power experimental transmissions were continuing from the Marconi Company's test site in the outskirts of Chelmsford, in a First World War army hut. 
They began by broadcasting technical data, but soon the research engineer we heard from a moment ago, Peter Eckersley, got frustrated and simply took off. He would recite, he would chatter extempore, he would do impressions and play music from records. He'd even occasionally burst into song. When we wanted to play a gramophone record, we had a perfectly good mechanical gramophone with open doors, and you opened the doors. And then you held the microphone in front of the open doors where the sound poured out from. Sorry about the preposition at the end of the sentence, but that's how it was. And if you wanted it louder, you just moved the microphone nearer. If you wanted it softer, you moved the microphone further away. We were able to keep one of the smoothest volumes controls that has ever been invented. Most of the time, the music was supplied from London, on record. But from time to time, a local soprano was invited to perform. This is Eckersley's colleague, Noel Ashbridge. Actually, the programme material came from Arthur Burroughs, who was a chief publicity man at uh, Marconi House, and he used to send down the record, and he used to send down, I suppose, about every other week, an artist, a sort of, uh, sort of ten guinea person, you know, who came down, plus expenses, ten guineas in those days. Or indeed, a one hundred guinea nighter, because occasionally the little hut in a field played host to far more glamorous talent, like the time the Danish baritone Lauritz Melchior turned up, to general amazement. Melchior, I think, had just been married and left his bride in Denmark comforted with a crystal set. And uh, he had the awful idea that the louder he sang, the more likely wife he was to hear him. We knew nothing of this fell intention. The man advanced with the microphone, as we always, he always had somebody to hold the microphone in front of the singer. Well, Melchior took a breath that sucked the windows shut, and he gave a bellow that shut the station down. <laughs> The experiments in the Essex village began nine months before the BBC's own first broadcast on the 14th of November 1922. And the impatient public, still awaiting the inauguration of a full broadcasting service, just had to sit it out. Marconi's team, at their new headquarters building in the Strand in London, continued to pump out test transmissions, largely consisting of musical numbers, from station call sign 2LO. 2LO, Marconi House, London, calling. 2LO, Marconi House, London, calling. 2LO. Vivian Chatterton, later a well-known radio actress, was at that time training to be a singer. She was one of a number of young artists who got the call from Marconi House. I think it was late September 1922. I was hauled out of a lesson to the telephone and a voice said, um, can you collect one or two people and come up and do an experimental concert in Marconi House? The voice said, well, it's for a new invention called wireless. And I said, well, well, well what's wireless? And the voice said, well, it's a, it's a means whereby uh, music is going to be brought into people's homes. So I got a couple of people and I was going to sing Max Brooks' Ave Maria. And in due course, we got to Marconi House and were taken up in a lift to a little tiny room right at the very, very top of the house, which was an absolute shambles. I can't tell you. The, the floor was cluttered up with wires and there were cases and goodness knows what. There was a piano. And when, in autumn that year, the first all-British wireless exhibition was staged at the Horticultural Hall in London, alongside all the sets on display, the star attraction was the daily programme of demonstration broadcasts by a wireless from a couple of miles away at Marconi House. Alongside the occasional humorist, the fair was largely musical. Mr Rodney Bennett, baritone, sang John Ireland, Mr. Walter Glynn, tenor, performed Purcell, and Miss Flora Woodman, soprano, executed the aria Una Voce Poco Fa from Rossini's Barbara of Seville. Another artist lined up to perform from the cramped Marconi House studio for the thousands of wireless enthusiasts tuned in in the hall in Pimlico was the pianist Morris Cole. And uh, in due course we fixed up that I should play it, I think, about half a dozen short, very short programmes for a very, very tiny fee. 
and these were to be specially transmitted to be received at the first all-British radio exhibition, I think that's what they called it, that was held in a hall not very far away from Marconi House. Edward German, Gounod, Chopin, Rachmaninoff were amongst the composers on the week-long programme of concerts broadcast to the exhibition from 2LO. And uh, it was a great adventure to broadcast, of course. I remember one man coming up to tell me, one night, we call them studio managers nowadays, I think they were balance and control or something in those days, came up and whispered in my ear while I was playing, oh, it's coming over very nicely. I was nearly put off, I nearly stopped at this point, you know. Listening, or as people in those days called it, listening in, was a pretty arduous business too. Early radios were cumbersome affairs, lash-ups of wire, glass and metal that hardly suited the comforts of the sitting room and required a heavy pair of headphones and a lot of twiddling of the cat's whisker to get anything worth listening to. Yet the magic that, back in 1920, had caught the imagination of listeners across Europe when Melba first broadcast was a powerful alchemy. To hear great music emerging from, as the saying went, the ether, was, for many, a life-changing experience. For Peter Eckersley, it certainly was. Well, the lucky people were able to um, put a microphone into the opera, into the Covent Garden, and all at once one put on a pair of headphones and was aware that something miraculous was happening. Because you suddenly were in the atmosphere of Covent Garden. You suddenly were conscious that this was music, that this had potentialities. And it was from that moment, the first hearing of those opera broadcasts, that I personally suddenly felt, look, I want to be in broadcasting. By October 90 years ago, the confusion and protracted discussions about what broadcasting in Britain was going to be and how it might work had been resolved. And on Wednesday, October the 18th, at the Institution of Electrical Engineers in Savoy Place, London, the British Broadcasting Company was born. Less than a month later, the familiar call sign of the Marconi Company's London transmissions, but now for the first time under the banner of the BBC, was heard on November the 14th, 1922. This is 2 L O, the London station of the British Broadcasting Company calling. 2 L O calling. It's perhaps worth pointing out that in 1922, despite the fact that record 78s were widely available, there was still no means of recording programmes before broadcast. That wouldn't come till Ludwig Blattner invented the eponymous Blattner phone in about 1930. So every concert, every recital the early BBC broadcast was automatically live. By the spring of 1923, the demands of the new service had outgrown the resources of Marconi House on the Strand. So began the so-called Savoy Hill days, in the building that belonged to the Institution of Electrical Engineers, just behind the Savoy Hotel in London. And with the new premises came a new sense of mission. See, I was brought up in a world of no music at all, really. I didn't hear a symphony orchestra till I was 20, and there was no radio, the gramophone was in its infancy and so on. Here did seem to be the opportunity to give everybody fine music. Kenneth Wright, who had made a name for himself amongst younger listeners in the north of England as Uncle Humpty Dumpty, was brought from the Manchester Regional Station to assist Rex Palmer and the others with music broadcasting from Savoy Hill. It was a big family, about 30 of us, I suppose, when I joined you. Yes, not more, I'm sure. And we all read the the news and mispronounced it and got told off by the Admiral. Oh, the Admiral, yes. Reith's deputy, ex-naval man Admiral Carpendale. The studios, though, were acoustically very unsatisfactory, for those who came to perform, as for those whose job it was to introduce them, like Stuart Hibbard. And in those days, it was a pretty nerve-wracking experience, because the studios, or at any rate one of them, very heavily draped with curtains, and if you were a singer, your voice felt as if it had simply gone out of the window, flat as could be. And if you were an instrumentalist, you wondered what on earth had happened. And the microphones in use in those early days, though an advance on the telephone mouthpiece variety that had been standard in Marconi House, were cumbersome affairs. The size and appearance of a studio plate camera and sat on top of long legs. It was a very fearsome-looking thing until it was covered by a rather artistic-looking silk, blue and gold silk case, and then I remember we used to call it the meat safe, the artistic meat safe. But woe betide any soloist who strayed too close or too far away. Kenneth Wright. 
we had a unique contrivance for adjusting the height of the microphone to the singer's mouth. The singer stood on a pile of books. One night a tenor, in taking a top note, also took a step backwards. There was a sickening thud as he crumpled up under the piano, and that was the end of that. Not perhaps therefore surprising that early wireless produced a fine crop of Heath Robinson cartoons, imagining the not-so-far-fetched escapades of technicians and performers. Take this story, again from Kenneth Wright, talking to Rex Palmer, featuring the admiral and a suitably nautical solution to the soloist's microphone problem. He came into the studio one night, you see, when he saw the singer who wasn't at the right distance from the microphone. Um, the engineer was sort of edging the singer forward and then pulling her elbow to bring her back on a top note. And uh, Admiral Cottendale thought that that wasn't right and we should have a, a much more efficient method, so he suggested that we should have semaphore down in the studio. And uh, suddenly, you see, an arm would drop in front of the wretched leader singer saying, step up, and another one would say, step back. But we managed to avoid that. <laughs> As if they weren't frightened enough already, <laughs> anyhow. But despite the problems, the Savoy Hill team were nothing if not ambitious. Percy Pitt joined the BBC from Covent Garden as general music director in 1926, and despite the relatively cramped surroundings, he was naturally keen to embark on a series of full-scale opera performances. One of the first he did was The Girl of the Golden West, and it calls for some effects which we'd never done in those days. It calls for a shot in the first act, which is in a bar, you remember? and um, somebody fires a revolver and smashes a mirror and so on. So I elected to do this outside the door. We opened the door at the right moment, and I fired the revolver, and another chap dropped some pieces of glass into a bucket. Well, nobody knows what it sounded like because it blew the transmitting valve, and we were off the air, I think, for ten minutes. It cost quite a lot of money, that transmission. <laughs> Reith's BBC was dedicated to presenting an enlightening as well as entertaining diet of programmes. And so, amongst the transmissions of dance music from the local band that became the BBC's regular late-night favourite, the Savoy Orpheans, there were, from almost the very beginning, regular improving talks about music. And by music, they meant always classical music. Wolford Davis was the prolific composer of symphonies, cantatas and anthems, and famously the RAF March Past and the beautiful minor key version of O Little Town of Bethlehem. But for wireless listeners, his medium was the radio talk. Stuart Hibbert had the pleasure of introducing him on air. Sir Walford was a fine musician with an exquisite touch and a charming speaking voice. Concentrating so hard and striving to get as near up to perfection as possible, he would, most unfortunately for us, lose all sense of time. And somehow or other I should have to give him a hint. But when, having run perhaps a few seconds or half a minute over, and the red light went out. I looked at him severely. He always disarmed me by saying, Oh, Hibbert, have I been the naughty boy again tonight? <laughs> the sense of novelty was everywhere in these earliest days of the BBC. Any new enterprise was almost certain to be a broadcasting first, the first Wimbledon, the first Ascot, the first boat race. And musically, the pioneers set their sights enormously high. I often wonder whether people realise that in those early days of broadcasting we actually relayed 11 complete operas from Covent Garden in 14 days. Or take this minor undertaking. This is the national programme from London. Mr Filson Young. In the church cantatas of Bach there exists a superb treasure of music which is practically unknown to the English public. There are something like 180 of these oratorios in miniature. It is our intention, Sunday by Sunday, to present these cantatas, one every Sunday, and to continue the presentation until the whole body has been performed and given to the English public. The style may have been pretty austere by today's standards, but as Filson Young, journalist and writer, also pointed out, the broadcast of the complete sequence of Bach cantatas was a hugely ambitious and expensive endeavour for the young organisation. Something of a marathon for the listeners, too, come to think of it. Primitive microphones relaying an imperfect signal to crystal sets that were liable to go out of tune at a moment's notice and heard on telephone earpiece-like headphones that barely offered any amplification whatsoever. As a listener, you had to be dedicated. 
But then, as the Dame Nellie Melba concert with which I began proved, this was the marvel of the age, when the undisturbed near silence of domestic life became invaded by the sound of music, being played and sung at that very moment in the greatest opera houses and concert halls of the land. As many in those early days referred to it, it truly was the miracle of broadcasting. Oh, yes, and as the interval in tonight's concert draws to an end, it's perhaps worth recalling how nine decades ago they filled the intermission. Twenty minutes, it certainly wasn't. In between the first and second acts of the magic flute, we put on a banjo and a contralto. I don't know what they were doing. Oh, and handbells, too, handbells. We all ought to blush for that even now. <laughs> 